Well, good morning, friends. I believe two minutes has passed. I don't know how precise Pastor Brent is, but I set my timer and uh, got two minutes. So I love it that we uh, we just uh, have an intermission, go get more coffee. That's good. So, hey, it's good to be here at Radiant Springs today. Uh, my wife, Cherie, and I are happy to be here. We are, we've been pastors for a number of years, mostly here in Nebraska, from way out west in Alliance, northwest corner in Chapel, the southwest corner, pretty close to the corner there, to um, the middle of the state, and um, we're happy to serve you here in Crete today. I love these um, slow walks through Scripture. I, 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 I presume Pastor Brent on Sunday mornings has been going through the book of Acts just from day to week to week, and uh, uh, I, I love that because it, it's, um, I learned in, in Bible school to preach the word and not to preach what I think about things. And, uh, and we are in Acts 21. By the way, how many of you were here last week for Pastor Brent's message? Okay, several of you were. I listened to the big squeeze on, um, on your website. That was a couple of weeks ago, and I listened to Miracle uh, Power uh, um, that he that he preached on last week, and I'm trying to make sure that I know what time it is so I don't abuse uh, your time today. Last week, though, I wanted to review what Pastor Brent did last week, and for those of you who were here, you'll probably recall some of this. Paul was in a place called Troas. He was meeting with the church on a Sunday which the first day of the week, like we're doing today, and he was leaving the next day. He was leaving Monday morning, and he had a lot to say, and he preached till midnight. Remember that? Yeah. Wow, that's, that's crazy. And Actually, he preached till morning. At midnight, there's one guy whose name is in Scripture, as far as I know that, only one time, Eutychus. What's he known for? Falling asleep during Paul's sermon. Falling out of a window and falling three stories down and dying. That's, uh, that, that happened right during church, around midnight. And Paul noticed he fell out of the window and everybody was startled. So they went downstairs. They picked him up. Paul did, prayed for him. He came back to life. What did they do? They went back upstairs and he preached for another six hours. And then Paul, or Pastor Brent last week, he made the applications that the church was giving priority to gathering on the Lord's Day, like we're doing still today, to breaking bread together. And churches typically do that once a month, some want every week. And they also gave priority to God's miracle working power. That was the essence of Pastor Brent's sermon last week. But it occurred to me... Aren't you glad he didn't also have a fourth point that said they gave priority to preaching until midnight and then till morning? Aren't you glad that we don't follow that priority here today? Because you, you probably have lunch plans, and so do I. So I won't preach till midnight or much less till morning. But Pastor Brent missed his opportunity to make that a priority too because the church did that that night, but thankfully it wasn't something they practiced all of the time. Now, we're going to pick up right where Pastor Brent left off in uh, chapter 20 of the book of Acts, beginning of verse 13. Now, I'm going to have some verses on the screen, but they're not in the format that you typically are used to. If you have a device or your own copy of Scripture, you might wish it might be easier for you to see some of them. But I want to just explain something before we get into the text here. Because when we preach through, like we're doing here, the book of Acts, we come to a place where there's some historical narrative. You've seen it before. In fact, we're going to see some of that. We're going to see Paul's itinerary as he travels from one place to another. And uh, that's not very inspiring, but it's part of Scripture, and I call it historical narrative. But but I want you to look, when we get into the verses we'll be looking at, I'd like for you to look at actual, the heart, Paul's heart. You're going to see something of the heart, I call it the heart of a pastor. Notice there's an asterisk by the word pastor. Um, because I, I just want to make an, I'll, I'll reference why I put that asterisk there. 
in a few moments, but we're going to see something into the heart of this man, Paul, Paul was an apostle. We think of him as an apostle. Uh, the word apostle is a biblical word. We typically think in terms of an apostle being a missionary, one who travels around planting churches and doing that kind of thing. He, you might even think Paul was kind of an evangelist, leading people to Jesus everywhere he went. But I, I am not a missionary, I'm not an evangelist, I'm a pastor, so I, I guess I'm seeing Paul's heart kind of the way that it connects with me, and the asterisk is going to be an effort to connect you to this story too, because let's just address that right now. In this room, I don't know, there may be some pastors here in the room, but I'm a pastor, my wife is a pastor, married to me for all these years, we served, I'm impressed by Amy, as she uh, serves with Brent, and yeah, I just commented to my wife, when a, when a person marries a pastor, they're involved, they're involved, and, and Amy is certainly involved here, as my wife has been involved in my life. So pastoring is an, a beautiful thing, but most of us here are not pastors, but I'd like for you to think, as I share this sermon, the heart of a pastor with the asterisk, I'd like for you to think of your life, even if you're not a pastor, I'd like for you to think in context of where you lead, because that's what pastors do. They lead, they shepherd. You do too, even if you don't have the title of pastor. You lead a family, you lead children, you lead a, you lead a business, you may lead a ministry here at Radiant Springs, you may, you may lead youth or children's ministry. You, you may lead a Bible study. You may be a leader in some context outside of the church, in the community, in the chamber of commerce, in your, in your business, in, in some club here in the community. So when I talk about the heart of a pastor with the asterisk, I'd like for you to make some calculations to how, how does this apply to me? Because I don't want you to sit there and think, well, that doesn't apply to me because I'm not a pastor. We're thinking of a pastor as a shepherd, a leader, and you too lead and shepherd in some context. So keep that in mind as we get into the rest of these scriptures. Uh, let's get into that, in fact. To, we'll go to verse 13. And, and that's a, the first thing I saw when I was studying this text. The heart of the pastor finds value in being with people and in being alone. Now, I got that from God's word in Acts chapter 20. Let me tell you how I got, came to that conclusion. Here's the historical narrative picking up where Pastor Brent left off. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made arrangements, he had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. Now let me just stop there at the end of verse 13. Paul and his traveling party had left Troas where Pastor Brent preached last week where Eutychus fell out of the window and now it's Monday morning and it's time to go. So these guys got on the ship and sailed around the Mediterranean there, but Paul said, you guys go on without me. I want to walk. Now, um, we don't know if he walked by himself or if he had a small contingent of people with him, but I can see Paul walking alone. We're not told why he chose to do that, but I'll comment on it from what I think in a moment. Verse 14, when he met us at Assos, we took him aboard and went on to Mytilene, the next day, we set sail from there and arrived at Chios. The day after that, we crossed over to Samos. And on the following day, we, raised, we arrived at Miletus. Now, I talked to you about historical narrative. By the way, these are verses that are never on a list of verses to memorize. Have you noticed that? John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that'll preach. But I don't know of anybody who's ever memorized these verses. There's probably somebody who's memorized the book of Acts and they could quote these things, but they're never popular verses to memorize because they're not that inspiring, really. 
They're historical narrative. They are God's word. And they're telling of these various towns that we know nothing about. But Paul traveled in those places. But let's go back to that solo walk Paul made from Troas to Assos. This was, I, I got on my computer and figured out how far of a distance that was, and some estimate it could have been a two-day journey of walking, uh, walking pretty much all day. Why did he do that? We are not told in Scripture, but I'm thinking with the heart of a pastor, the heart of a leader like you are in whatever context. You know, there are, there are times when we're with a lot of people. We have to be with a lot of people at some times because the job requires that. It's, nece ne it's necessary. But there are times where it's good to be alone, too. I heard Amy earlier talking to my wife, and she said, Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, it's, I like my time alone, but I'm, I'm looking forward to Brent getting home. I think most of us would say, We like that alone time at times, but it's good to be with people, too. Certainly our family and our church family, our people at work, things like that. This is the heart of the pastor, Paul. Paul chose to walk instead of be comfortable on the ship and take that, that quick trip down to that next town. He took a two-day walk. I suppose he prayed. I suppose he sought God. I suppose he said, I need some exercise. All of those and more could have been the reason. But the heart of the pastor loves to be with people and doesn't mind being alone. That's what I see here from Paul. And in my experience, many of us as pastors, many, many pastors I know are not extroverts. They, much, they very much enjoy being with, with, alone, but they very much enjoy being with people. I'm that way. I'm kind of an introvert by nature, but God's called me to be with people. And I, I take great joy in being with my people, with you today too but I don't mind being alone either. Somebody has said, if you don't spend time alone with God, then you don't have anything to say when you're with people. And that's a good thought. Alone in prayer, alone in study, alone in seeking after God, those kinds of things. So Paul, for whatever reason, and I'm, I'm just attributing it to something of the heart of the pastor, he loves to be with people, and he draws strength in being alone. Maybe you're that way too, whether you're a, a mom raising little kids. You're, a, you're mom and dad, your parents, and, and you have your, your busy, crazy time with your young children, and, but you're glad when they go to bed at night. And uh, yeah, the most wonderful time of the year is when school starts back up, you know? Hey, let me show you a picture. This picture is a cool picture I found about, this is the Roman road. And I hope you can see it. To the very top, it says the Citadel of Assos. There's a little hill there. And at the bottom, there's a line pointing back down to the lower left corner of the picture. It says to Alexandria and Troas. About a 28-mile journey between where Paul would have walked for those two days from um, from the for Troas to meeting the ship in the other in in the next place. The point is, um, they um, Paul walked some of that road anyway. That's an original Roman road, the ruins of it. The Romans were famous for building roads, and uh, some of them remain today. And it's interesting. I love to look at things like that and wonder if Paul actually walked on those stones along that path and saw some of that uh, some of that terrain of the of the uh, landscape there the point is uh, that's a kind of an alone place to be and Paul somehow found strength from that anyway now we have them at Miletus in the verses that I read another town I don't know much about anything about and you don't either probably but they're there, so let's read verse 16. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry, listen to that, he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. So this is some of the dynamics of what's going on with Paul. He's in a hurry to reach Jerusalem. 
Uh, but he's got this long journey to, to follow. And we come now to a second thing I observe here in, um, in verse uh, 16 and 17 following here. Let's look at it. The heart of the pastor often senses God's leading before others do. Go to the next slide. I think it is, um, yeah, the heart of the pastor. No, we're, we're ahead a little bit or I'm, I'm messed up here. Uh, the heart of the pastor. Yeah, go back to the one that says the heart of the pastor often senses God's leading before others. Uh, if you if we don't if I gave it to you wrong, I'll just tell you the story. The point is, Paul is heading to Jerusalem, and as I just read to you in verse sixteen, he can't wait to get there, but if possible, by the day of Pentecost. He really wants to get there, but he's in this place called Miletus. So what does he do? Let me go to verse 17. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. Now, Ephesus was about 50 miles away from where he was. So Paul just settles in in this little town called Miletus, and he's visiting with his friends there, but we've already seen he's in a hurry to get to Jerusalem. He really wants to get there, but he really has a love for the people of Ephesus, but he doesn't want to take the time to go there. So he does the next best thing while he's visiting friends in Miletus. He sends for the elders of Ephesus to come to him and to visit with him there because he has a great love for them. He's sensing, though, something is about to change in his life. And there are times when we as families, business owners, ministry leaders in our churches, we sense something is changing. My wife and I were driving down here this morning, and we're, we're at an interesting time of life, kind of semi-retired. And we're kind of looking to the future, saying, what's our next step? We're sensing something will change for us, but we don't know exactly what it is. That's a little bit of what this leader, Paul, is sensing about his own life. And there are times when we're like that as leaders in our church, as leaders in our family, leaders in our business. I remember as my wife and I, as our kids were, they're all grown now, but I remember taking our first kid, our son Jeremy, to to college in Minnesota. And I remember, wow, I don't think we were ready for that. And I don't think... she and I said a word to each other all the way home from, from Minneapolis. It was, it was just shocking to us when uh, we, we really weren't prepared. We knew something was going to change because our, our nest was getting empty, but we weren't prepared for it. Leaders sometimes anticipate something's going to change, but I don't know exactly what that means. Let's get to that slide I think I did see at the heart of the pastor having a great devotion to his or her people. Let's read this text. It's a little bit cluttered on there. I think it's the next slide, verses 18 through 21. When they arrived, this is the people from Ephesus. They came all the way down from Ephesus to this place to meet with Paul because he had sent for them. And listen to Paul's heart. This is, this is where we get away from historical narrative. And we see into the heart of the Apostle Paul, the leader, the pastor. And I'd like for you to think, again, in applications for you, even if you're not a pastor. Think of it in t- context of your leadership in whatever context you lead. When they arrived, Paul said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but you have taught, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus." This is one of the most touching reunions in Scripture that I see is Paul 
greets the Ephesian elders as they come to see him because he's about to say some things that are very heartbreaking in some ways. And that gets to the next point, a big, big idea I wanted to share. The, the heart of the pastor updates is updating them on seasons of change that are about to happen in his life. Look at verse 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I'll just stop very briefly to say the Ephesian elders would have loved for Paul to come back to Ephesus. He had spent over two years there in a previous time. He, maybe he had planted the church, started the church. They loved Paul. But Paul is now saying, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm not sure what's going to happen to me there. I just sense change. And he's sort of preparing these beloved friends of his for a time of change for him. And he goes on to say in verse 23, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. You're going to see more of that if Pastor Brent continues to verse to chapter 21 because people are going to warn him, hey, you're going to, there's big trouble for you there if you go to Jerusalem. And they said, don't go. But Paul, as you'll see in chapter 21, says, no, I'm going. Paul senses this is a right thing, but he, does, he doesn't understand all of the ramifications of it. Verse 24, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. You see, he really wants to connect with these dear friends, but he's got this news which they're not going to be too happy about because in his case, there's, there's some changes happening here, and he, he's about to enter the season of change. And look at verse 20, uh, 25. Now I know. Listen to this. This is shocking. Picture yourself to be an Ephesian elder. You're the pastor of the church at Ephesus. You're a deacon of the church at Ephesus. You're a ministry leader at the church at Ephesus, and you've made this trip 50 miles down to see Paul because you love this guy so much. He's so special to you, and you've made the journey, and you embrace him, and you just, oh, it's good to see you again, Paul. And um, what's new with you? And he's telling you these things. Look at what he says now in verse 25. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Wow. That must have been hard for them to hear. None of you will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. I'm sure that the Ephesian elders were in shock because this is the point. Whether you're a pastor or a business leader or a parent, you, at times you sense it's a new day. And, and, and you have to lead through that new day in your family, in your business, in your ministry, in your whatever, whatever context. It's a new day, and Paul is admitting that. He, but, but here's a beautiful thing about Paul. And being an old pastor myself now, an older pastor, I've been in the ministry since 1975, I love the young pastors who are following me. I love those who, they have gifts that I don't have. They have, they have the abilities uh, to connect that, that I never did acquire. But I love, up in Lincoln, there's a lot of young pastor friends of mine, and I love to invest in them. And here's what Paul is doing. Look at the next slide. The heart of the pastor commissions others for the ongoing work. Look at what Paul says here. Keep watch over yourselves and over the flock, of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, now listen, this is, this is hard to hear, but it's true. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. 
even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul is telling that these, these people from Ephesus, and Paul is telling all of us today here in Crete, even if you're not a pastor, as a leader to prepare to raise up others who are leading in your place someday. That's a mistake my generation can make in the, in the realm of being pastors. Just thinking that we're going to do this forever when time, time tells us that someday we're going to die. And I don't want to be in the church if there's no young men and women coming up behind us. In your business, in your ministry, here in the church or in the city, as an older leader, Paul is giving us an example to say, invest in next generation leaders. I'm so happy to hear Amy's report about the youth group and these young people that were celebrating with Javen this past. Javen is another young pastor right here in our state who I have great respect for, much, much younger than me. But I believe in that man. And I believe in the teenagers that God is calling to rise up. And God is saying here through Paul, I commission you to that task. I, 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 I anticipate you're going to do a great job of it. We've got to finish up the text. Let's go to verse 30, 30, uh, 33. I have not coveted. This is the heart of the pastor who demonstrates character. If, if you're a leader in any context, as I am, it's imperative that we demonstrate character, godly, godly character. Paul's saying, I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. By the way, is it okay for a pastor to earn a living from being a pastor? Yes, that is okay. The Bible does teach that. But there were times where Paul said, I don't want your support. I'm going to make tents. I'm going to pay my own way. And for whatever reason, at least for a season, Paul must have done that in Ephesus. He says, these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companion. In everything I did, I showed you that this kind of, through this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of Jesus himself, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And then lastly, the last verses in the verses that I was asked to share today, verses 36 through 38, I'd like for you to think of this as ter in the terms of the heart of the pastor pronouncing blessing on the next generation. Paul is effectively doing this. He's, he's pronouncing a blessing on the Ephesian elders. By the way, the term elders usually it makes us think of old people. But an elder doesn't nest, it can refer to age, but it also can refer to calling and, um, and um, spiritual maturity, even if there's not a lot of years on them. So whether, again, you're a pastor or whether you're a family leader, you're a ministry leader, think in terms of blessing the next generation. You're investing in them, but to bless them. Paul says it this way. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was the statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. We're not told the details of that blessing. We're not told the details of the prayers. I perceive, though, that Paul went around and he laid hands on people. 
I wouldn't doubt if Paul even gave some sort of prophetic uh, 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 prayers over these individuals, maybe different for different people. But it ended up with weeping, embracing, kisses even. But the people at Ephesus were very much touched by Paul's words that they would never see him again. Leaders, leaders realize that their, their leadership has a shelf life. And um, that's why they invest in the next generation. I want to ask the musicians to come up and join me here. Because I want to bring this to a close by just trying again to, to, to help us all recognize, even though the word pastor was up there a lot today, Please think of the asterisk by the pastor, by the word pastor. Think of yourself as, a, as connecting with this message in the fact that you are a father, you're a mother, you're a parent, you're a teacher, you're a deacon, you're a Bible study leader, you're a youth leader, a children's ministry leader. You see, Paul's example gives us some insights into the kind of heart these people would have. The kind of heart that enjoys being alone and spending time with God, but finds joy in being with the crowd we serve as well. This kind of heart will often sense that God is saying something before they even understand everything specifically of what God is saying. You see, God speaks to leaders. God speaks to parents. God speaks to business leaders who are devoted to, to the kingdom of God. God speaks to those who are shepherding others. And sometimes we don't even understand the end of the story. We just sort of get advance notice. Paul had experienced that here. The heart of the pastor is the kind of heart that demonstrates great devotion to those that they serve. They sincerely love them and pray for them like we love and pray for our children. This, this kind of heart courageously faces and ta travels through seasons of change I think all of you, you're probably, I'm probably like a lot of you, I don't especially look forward to seasons of change. At some point you just say, can't things just go on the way they were? But again, my wife and I were talking, processing some things, watching our own parents grow old. And three of the four parents that Sherry and I had were, are, are gone now. And now we're becoming those older parents of children who have their own children and we don't have great-grandchildren yet, but that could happen. That's going to be a challenge for us, but we need to anticipate that as, as a couple that we are and boldly travel through those seasons of change knowing that this is the way of life. This kind of heart, the heart of the pastor, passes the torch, torch to others. And being a pastor who's soon to be 70 years old, I'm going to be the biggest fan of young pastors. I'm not going to be threatened by them. And if you're in a ministry, raise up new leaders in your own group. You may be amazing at your leadership, but I'm a believer that some of the best leaders our churches will ever have in terms of ministry, they're not even in the church yet. But they're going to be coming into the church and following Jesus, and God's going to bring them up in great, great abilities and then to pronounce blessing on them. What a privilege that would be. We're going to close with this song in a moment, but before we do, may I pray a prayer of blessing? on you in whatever context you are in. Think of the context you are in as a leader, as a shepherd. And ask God to give you a, a, an increasingly soft heart in the context of your leadership. Lord, 
Thank you for this insight into Paul's heart at a very strange time in his life. I think most of us like for things to go on the way they are, especially if they're going well. But in my experience, uh, things change. Our, we grow older and people choose things that are different and it changes everything. Lord, I pray for the individuals who are hearing me right now, Lord, that the, the story of Paul and the demonstration of his heart would have some application to all of us, that we might approach these things, this moment of our life and every moment that will come as people of faith and realizing that this is the way of life and I pray God that we could be as courageous in facing it as Paul was even though he didn't exactly know what was going to happen he knew it was good it was the right direction to go to Jerusalem so pr I pray for my friends please help us help Sherry and I help everyone here in the room and on watching online to know this peace to walk day by day by faith we pray this in Jesus' name. We're going to close with this song. If I can pray with any one of you, um, I'll be happy to do that. I'll just stand over here in case uh, at the end of the service I could connect with you just for a moment. It's been a joy to be here today to share with you from the book of Acts. I pray blessing on this church as well. Pastor Brent and Amy and all of you in whatever capacity you lead. Amen. As Pastor Brent says, greet each other as you leave, and uh, we'll see you back here next week. And if you are a nursery worker or a nursery helper, in just a couple minutes, we'll just have a, a short meeting right up here at the front.